Hello all of you little demons, Jules here for WhatCulture.com, back again with another episode of the awesomely named and awfully hosted Choose Your Own Adventure, the weekly medieval theme format where I, the crown jewels of WhatCulture.com, take a list chosen by you, yes you the person who has a new hat, but also no bike still, it's still in the repairs and it's throwing off the feng shui of the room and I don't like it, but at least I've got this hat, this lovely Live and Let's Dice hat, to keep me company. Ah, ah, and yes I will keep the sticker on it, because... Apparently that's a thing that, that you do sometimes, and it, 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 I'm not taking it off just yet. Fresh out of the box. Anyway, yes, you get to decide what list I dole out to you each and every week. Now, apologies. There was a suggestion for this week's episode, but I cannot for the life of me find the comments, so I'm just going to go... Cameron Kelly. For their suggestion of video game sequels that took things a little bit too far, that broke what didn't need to be fixed, and trust me, there were quite a lot of examples for this list. After all, a sequel is meant to be an opportunity for the devs to be able to address issues in the original while expanding on what worked, and so fans have often got their sights set a little higher for sequels than previous titles, as this should be a surefire hit, right? However, as we all know, sometimes a sequel can lose sight of why it rose to public claim in the first place, either by doubling down on the wrong elements or, as is the case of a lot of these entries, totally shifting focus away from what put them in the spotlight. It would be like us replacing jazz with a carrot, it wouldn't make any sense and people would lose one of the main reasons they watch this show, so with that in mind let's get on with it. I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com and these are 8 video game sequels that took things too far. And you know the drill by now, say hi to me here in the live chat and put your suggestions for next week's episode down in the comments section below. And with that in mind, Let's get on with that list, shall we? Number 8. Army of Two Devil's Cartel so, if there's one thing in this world sure to make my skin nearly invert through cringe, it's got to be bro culture. The idea of ranking men internally by terms of alpha and beta decisions is one that might as well read misogynist and douchebag, as apart from other backslapping, yes, that is a real sword on my wall, cool guys, you're not impressing anyone. Plus, this statement of me not wanting to be a part of this male bro culture is itself, according to said male bro culture, a sigma move which just shows you how redundant the entire system is if me saying I don't want to be a part of it places me near the top of that list. And look at me. I shouldn't be at the top of any manly list anywhere. Long story short, Army of Two is a brotastic game for water cooler masturbators who love telling each other about how great their latest whey protein shake was. And the worst thing of it all was that the franchise didn't have to turn out this way. Originally, the franchise focused on co-op integration, coordinated attacks, and a fair few cheesy one-liners. It wasn't perfect by any stretch, but it was a pretty refreshing experience nonetheless. However, when it got to Devil's Cartel, the devs had actively removed a ton of the co-op moves, and instead this was just fast and furious with monster energy drink level hype replacing the cars. Had the series gone down the rabbit hole of finding more co-op moves and pushing teamwork as the main focus, then we'd probably be championing the series, but alas they doubled down on the bro, and we collectively said... No. Number 7. Pac-Man 2 Now just imagine being in that moment when you were called into the Pac-Man HQ offices to sit down and hear about the newest pitch for Pac-Man 2. Just try and wrap your head around that moment when those in charge said with straight-faced authority that Pac-Man was going to ditch the mazes, the pellet munching and basically everything that made it such a breakout hit and instead was going to focus on point and click puzzle solving. I mean, you'd be sitting there thinking, have you scoffed pills that you found in your desk or something? What is going on here. Yet, this was indeed the case with the utterly insane Pac-Man sequel, which took everything that worked, tossed it out the window, and attempt to reinvent the wheel with a mouth. Now, normally I'd say that such a radical departure would have been a death sentence for such a game, but you know what? Pac-Man 2 is just so weird that it actually kind of works. Helping the little yellow fella through a series of incredulous scenarios is incredibly fun. However, I do have to point out that him ignoring you for 90% of the time to just do even the most basic of commands was not fun you little yellow bastard. Clearly the devs thought the same though, as they have never ever returned to this very weird tangent of the great iconic franchise ever since. Number 6. Steel Battalion Heavy Armor Now depending on who you ask, Steel Battalion pretty much started things straight out of the gate by pushing the envelope a little too far, what with its controller that screamed yes I am single and not by choice. Which I'm not gonna lie, I desperately want. I mean look at all these buttons, I mean seriously most of them are just to start the bloody mech up and I love how needlessly 
awesome that is. However, when it came to the much belated sequel Steel Battalion Heavy Armor, the devs took a rather different approach. And by that, I mean that they lost their bloody minds and decided to wrap the entire experience around the dodgy Del Boy motion sensor that was the Kinect. Of all the gimmicks to tie a video game to, this is right up there with putting the best Wario Land game on the migraine machine, aka the Virtual Boy. Waving your arms in desperate frustration at the Kinect in order to do even the most simple of actions is like watching somebody showcase what death itself is like through interpretive dance. It was no surprise that this game bombed so hard, seeing as many just couldn't even make it through the tutorial without throwing a brick at the Kinect, which in this case might as well be another Kinect for how useful it was. I mean, credit to the team for at least trying something new, but last time I checked, most gamers want, let me just check my notes here, functioning controls. Uh, oh. Number 5. eFootball 2022 So let's face facts, there was a lot riding on eFootball 2022 when it was announced, because a lot of people were just like, why are you rebranding Pez? I mean, th that's a very beloved franchise right there. You're slapping a new logo on it, and we're kind of struggling to see why. Oh, wait, now we do, because <laughs> you want to sell us off every tiny morsel of this game. Cheers, Konami. Now sure, Konami and every other gallon of crude oil and marketing buzzwords that was poured into a suit calling itself a higher up claimed that eFootball was a brand new experience, but in reality this rebrand was done solely to tear apart everything that payers had built up by creating a free-to-play experience that would sell literally everything it could back to its loyal fan base in the most bizarre ways possible. First came the pre-order promises that were bundled with oodles of premium, oh sorry there's a mistake in my script there, I meant to say worthless, in-game currency and the promise of features and modes that wouldn't be available on launch, meaning that you were pre-ordering a supposedly free game and getting less content for your money. Good start, right? Beyond this was the abysmal launch, which was plagued with bugs and issues so aggressive that even the price tag of nothing started to make people feel short-changed. And even in its current state with the first rollout of updates and content injections, the game feels utterly barren. It was a game that changed everything in its pursuit of pennies, but unfortunately it got its hands stuck in the cookie jar decided to smash it against the wall and lacerated itself, leading it, the entire franchise to just bleed out on the floor and we're just like, it's meant to be a football game, this is dark! Number 4, Band Hero. Oh boy, the video game industry of 2005 to 2010 sure was a wild time, right? Now, I say this because it's probably the only time in the collective gaming industry where players actually had to ask themselves a very weird question. Where am I going to store all of my weird plastic instruments? We have the likes of Guitar Hero and Rock Band to thank for this mountain of plastic, and soon, thanks to declines in sales and indeed storage space, it was a case where one of the many expansions or updates would come along and break the rhythm clean in two, and that game was Band Hero. With a dramatic shift from heavy rock and metal towards a more mainstream pop music focus, and a whole slew of new controllers to stuff under the bed, the bubble then burst in dramatic fashion. Activision reported a notable drop in sales, which was highly ironic considering the shift in musical tone was done to attract a wider audience, and thanks to the difficulty of these tracks also being nerfed, the hardcore players shimmied around this cacophony of mistakes. The publisher tried to draw from the well one too many time and unfortunately ran dry on the thing that actually counted innovation. Number 3. Dead or Alive Extreme 3 Fortune slash Venus Okay, so let's get something clear here. Yes, I have played every single version of the Extreme Beach Volleyball series, and no, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I played them for their surprisingly compelling and robust volleyball mechanics. However, what I did notice upon playing through the three games was that the length of the showers that I'd need to take to wash the stank off of me were getting longer and longer, and this was down to Fortune slash Venus, depending on your console of choice, dropping all pretense of minigame fun and silly narratives, and instead becoming solely about the plot. If you can, just put, like, the plot, um, in air quotation marks on the screen. The devs expected the third instalment to make a splash with their admittedly pervy fanbase, but ended up kicking a load of sand in their faces thanks to the decision to drop some of the better fleshed out minigames in order to focus on the exposed flesh elsewhere. In doing this, the illusion was finally shattered. There was no way that you could defend the game saying that you were playing it just for the gameplay. I mean, that was paper thin to begin with, and now that had been torn into chunks and thrown into the air like confetti. Not even the hardcore set wanted to defend this game, 
and in turn, it turned this spin-off into a real bin-off. Number two, Dynasty Warriors 9. Now, Dynasty Warriors 9 is the curious case of a game that probably should have stayed in its weirdly lucrative lane and actually did the worst thing possible, which was try to innovate. Now, most franchises would be raked over the coals for not innovating, but here, people just wanted more of the same and they were happy to pay for it. The simplistic button mashing combo approach to these games mixed with their epic one versus 1000 mantra made Dynasty Warriors a smash hit series across the globe and fans were more than happy enough to shell out for each new addition as long as it contained maybe one or two new playable officers. In fact, the two times that the series diverged from this formula ended up being the most reviled entries, namely Dynasty Warriors 6 and Dynasty Warriors 9. With DW6 came the Renbu system, which promised fans ultimate combos, which let me tell you as a diehard fan was like being told here's unlimited spending money in the factory of dreams. However, in reality, this actively removed your combat options as you had to build up a combo meter in order to gain access to the better attacks. Dynasty Warriors 9, on the other hand, decided to take things open world, meaning that while we did get more areas to explore, most of the landscape was utterly devoid of anything to do, and it meant that all the busy work of open world titles was also dolloped into this experience. Ah, oh, da shock horror. Surprisingly, people don't want to ride on horseback for 15 minutes to go and battle like 10 dudes and then spend another 15 minutes riding back. Ah, oh, who could have predicted that? We wanted epic scale battles, but what we got was a few car park beatdowns showing just how much DW9 had tried at overextending its ideas. And number one, Arm Spirit. Arcade. Okay, so before I begin this entry, I have to preface this a little bit and you do so by doing this. Yes, it's the Evil Finger Temple. It's back again. I know that James Dowes hates it, but I have to explain because this game actually isn't a sequel. What it is, is a spiritual sequel to other arm wrestling video games that were in the arcade at the time. So yes, it is a technicality that I'm trying to get away on, but I think that you'll understand why I want to talk about Arm Spirit, because, and uh, I really want you to pay attention here, this arcade game broke three people's arms. I think things went a bit too far there. I think that when a game can actively destroy those playing it, that things have officially gone a little bit off the deep end, and thus it wasn't long before Arm Spirit was pulled from arcades. Oh, but not before a really gross statement was made by Atlas, who said that even women should be able to beat it. Yikes. And apparently they were only removing the cabinets as a precaution and not an admission of guilt that their game, once again, broke the arms of those that played it. But then again, maybe the name Arm Spirit was actually pretty apt because it was sending four arms to f***ing heaven. And there we go, my friends. Those were eight video game sequels that took things too far. I hope that you enjoyed that and please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below, as well as any other ideas that you've got for next week's episode. I love to read all your comments, your big legends there. So pop all your suggestions down there as well. But if if you want to chat to me further in the meantime you can do so by going over to twitter and typing in at retro j but the o is a zero or you can swing by live and let's dice as me trying to spell it out again live and let's dice what a clever play on words it is where i do all of my warhammer about reports with my friends as well it'd be great to see you over on that section as well my friends but before i go i just want to say one thing yes it was amazing to see james dow's live I know that a lot of people are already going to be like, why, why didn't you film more stuff? But we were very busy that day. But also that I hope that you treat yourself well with love and respect, my friend, because you deserve the best things in life and don't let anything or anyone else tell you otherwise, all right? You deserve love. You deserve happiness. You deserve all of the success in the world. Now go out there and smash it, my friend, because you're not alone. We're all with you. As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.